So, good afternoon, everybody. I am Antoine, and I do research in computational biology at Harvard University. And today I'd like to discuss with you how we started using Blender to simulate biological cells in 3D. And well, as I'm probably one of the very few biologists in this room, I was curious to know the first thought that would come to non-biologist minds when they saw the title of my talk. And so I did what any very rigorous scientist would do. I went and asked my mom and dad. And so they, they responded to this great question, which I really love, and so it's, Antoine, why on earth would you want to simulate cells? And well, I responded to them that cells are one of the fundamental components of life, that they can be found in all living things, including microorganisms, plants, and animals like us humans. And that a greater understanding of how cells behave and operate together in our tissues might result in improvement in biomedicine and other related fields. And well, even though my parents were slightly disappointed that I was not going to save the world, say, with Blender, I kept on explaining to them that modeling and simulating are great ways of figuring out which mechanism prevails in systems with several mechanisms, which is very much the case when trying to understand collections of cells or, should I say, tissues. And in our lab, we study the embryonic development of zebrafish. That is, how can one single fertilized egg can evolve into a fully grown fish? And it all starts with a zygote. The zygote is the first cell, the first fertilized cell. And it first divides in two. Then it divides again, again, and again. And so it reaches about a 1,000 cells uh, in just a matter of three hours, which is completely mind-blowing. And development then continues to reach uh, gastrulation and epiboly, during which some cells from the external layer of the embryo tug into the interior, and that will form future tissues. And so after about, say, 10 hours of embryonic development, the head and the tail bud now becomes visible, and then development continues. The tail bud will continue to extend, and um, body movement will now be possible, and the primary organs now become visible, development is happening. And so after, say, something like 20, 24 hours, we now clearly see something that resembles a tiny fish. And so as you can all appreciate, it is mind-blowing how in such a short amount of time, development happens. So the precision and the robustness of the cell is something that we're fascinated by and that I hope everyone will be after this talk. And so we believe that nature has developed a recipe book of strategies for precisely programming tissue patterns and shapes. And so in order to decipher these recipes in that book, our lab uh, has pioneered a suite of approaches. And so, well, first we can genetically perturb these living embryos. That means that we can turn on and off some components and properties of the cells. Then we can visualize those genetic perturbations using a microscopy technique called in toto imaging. And in toto imaging is gorgeous because it allows us to image and track every single cell movement in a living embryo in 3D and over time. So, I mean, Look at that, it is simply gorgeous, even though it is not yet a Blender animation, it inspires us. And then we can um, digitize those time-lapse 3D images using computer vision and meshing algorithms. Then finally, we can use mathematical modeling to identify the set of general principles that can recreate life on computers. And it is the last bit here that I really want to stress out during this talk. And so there are many ways of modeling a system, but here I'd like to introduce one of the inspirations behind this project, and that is cellular automata theory. And one of the most famous applications of this theory remains the game of life that John Conway, genius mathematician, developed in the, the 70s, and well, I I even though I discovered this game when I was a kid or probably more a teenager. I never thought it would actually inspire my research, but here we are. 
And so say you have a grid, and each cell on that grid is an agent. And very simple rules basically governs the behaviors of that cell. And so from such a simplistic set of rules, what Conway observed is pretty remarkable because some very complex multicellular patterns arise from that. And so that got us thinking about embryonic development. Basically, can we recreate a, a realistic game of life um, with a set of rules that are, that, that are rigorously based from principles from biology and physics? And so, you know, to do so, I need to introduce a little bit more of biology. Bear with me. I promise should be easy, or at least bring back some lovely memories, maybe from high school biology. Um, and so, yeah, we'll define some rules together here. Well, first thing first, biological cells are deformable 3D objects, and they obey to some very specific surface and soft body physics. And we can model them mathematically using meshes. That is, as you all probably know, a collection of vertices connected by edges. And meshes are great because they have a really high spatial resolution, so that allows us to capture quite precisely and plausible um, positions and shapes of cells within tissues. Then biological cells move in their environment. And we have observed that one type of movement that those cells can be approximated by a random walk. So in other words, the position of a cell at its next time steps can be approximated by the position of that cell at the previous time step plus a random coordinate that can be generated really easily. Then say you have two distinct cells, and they move randomly in the environment. And so at some point, they will get close to each other. They will collide. And so thanks to cell-cell adhesion, now those two cells will stick together. They now adhere to one another. And so this is a strategy or, or, or rule that is super important to development, because otherwise, life would just fall apart. Tissues would not stick together. I don't know what we would look like. Probably not like humans. And so we've seen in microscopy movies that those cells divide. And a, a really simple model for cell division here is the following. So first, you have uh, a cell that, growth, uh, that grows its volume until it matches a certain target. Then a ring pinches the, the cell surface um, along a division plane. And how that division plane is being computed by cell um, is rather complex, but here we just assume that uh, the division plane is the plane that is perpendicular to the, to the cell's long axis that we need to compute, and that passes through the cell's center of mass. And because all of these are meshes, we can do that mathematically. Um, and so once the constriction is done, you now have a mother cell that has been divided into two distinct daughter cells. And then cells often need to work in harmony, pretty much like us, and even when they are separated by really long distance. And so say we can isolate two cells here, and even though they are quite not touching, they are actually intrinsically linked because they're having molecular conversations here. And in other words, cells can send molecules in their environment, but they can also monitor the molecules that are in their environment. And it is, I mean, communication is super important. I'm sure we can grasp that as humans, as a society, that it is crucial for coordinations and regulation of collectives of agents, and in this case, cells. And so the next rule we should discuss is how these external, inform external information molecules are being processed by the cell to change in, fun in, in cells functions and properties. So picture cell A and B that we've seen previously. We know that they're having some kind of a molecular conversations between each other. And now imagine we can zoom inside cell B. And so what we actually observe is a lot of molecules all over the place. And we can model that in a set of circuits made of genes, proteins, and RNAs. Here simply put as A, B, and C for illustration. And we, can, we call that regulatory circuits, because A, B, and C can regulate each other's positively or negatively. 
And the output of the circuits is, again, the regulation of the cell's function, such as the rate of growth, such as uh, the rate of um, division, such as the strength that they will have between each other. And so they really are a key part of maintaining the delicate cell's balance within an environment that is constantly changing. Growth rate, division rate, adhesion strength being modified here. And so now that we have defined models for each individual role, what might happen if we combine them together in simulations on computers? And it's really this question that drives the development of Goo. And so Goo is a Python-based Blender extension to simulate biological cells in 3D. And that's what I've been working for now um, a bit more than a year and a half and that was already previously developed before, and I will now discuss the different implementation behind our Blender extension. So first thing that, got me, that really got me thinking about cells in Blender is the amazing soap bubble simulations that you can find all over the place on YouTube. They are gorgeous, and we found that the, the common feature between a soap bubble and a cell is that they will both undergo deformations when a stress is being applied. So in other words, they are just soft bodies in the realms of, of simulation. And so as many of you might be aware, Blender's cloth physics offers a powerful solution for simulating soft bodies. And so that's what we did. And so the way cloth are, are being simulated in Blender is via mass spring damper systems. Um, in such systems, every mass, every node is a mass that is being connected by springs, and those springs then uh, can be controlled by a certain stiffness. And so that will control the overall mechanical behavior um, of those soft body. And so what we just did is transforming ordinary meshes into dynamic soft bodies. And those soft bodies are now capturing the overall mechanical behaviors of cells. And we took an amazing care at fine-tuning lots of Blender parameters towards applications of cells. And so a crucial characteristic of those soft bodies and of cells is their elasticity. Because when a relatively normal stress is being applied, such as, as when two cells collide and adhere, uh, the cells undergo deformation. But when the stress is being relieved, the cell will then revert to its original shape. And that's the concept we call elasticity. I should, of course, note here uh, for some biologists and maybe physics in the room or the ones looking um, from their home, that this, of course, only applies to deformation or stresses that are below a certain threshold. Because above that threshold, then that would cause permanent deformation. And so on top of cloth physics, uh, we also added an adaptive remeshing algorithm to improve numerical stability. And so that's really powerful when we're simulating um, really complex shapes. And so here, meshes are allowed to dynamically relax over the simulation time. And so therefore, at each frame, meshes are being remeshed to ensure uh, the numerical stability. Then we also use force fields to program cells to adhere to one another. And we design these force fields in such a way that they can now follow the cell's center of mass of their corresponding cell, of course. And then also cell cell adhesion is a process that only happens at the surface of the cell. So um, we made those force fields so that they are only active, bounded around the surface uh, of, each, uh, of each cell. And so cell-cell adhesion is a widely studied concept in, in biology and in developmental biology. And it's a metric, that is, and a metric that is commonly reported in this field is the contact area between the two mesh. And so thanks to that, thanks to simulation, we can report these metrics uh, in a very easy way. And so we implemented a method to calculate that. And as expected, when adhesion strength increases, so does the contact area between the two cells. So I've now discussed a little bit uh, of like details about Blender implementation, but let's take a break from that and have a little sneak peek inside Blender. And so we, co we coded our library written in Python so that it's super user-friendly. 
you can actually launch simulations in just a few lines of codes. And also, we are taking advantages of the collections in Blender so that each cell has its own collection that acts as a container for its underlying mesh, but also for all the attributes and force fields. Then we actually also use force fields to make cells move randomly in their environment. And how we, do, how we did that is that we programmed force field to move around a cell or a mesh, and it attracts the cell. And so the consequence is, is that you will have cells that move randomly according to where the force field is being positioned uh, in the scene. And uh, Using our library, you have a really simple function, function that lets user to try out many combinations of parameters, uh, such as the strength of that motion forces, or also the random distribution or the size of that distribution uh, that can be used uh, to control the movement of the cell. And so typically, adhesion forces are larger than random forces. So that means that when put together, two cells will travel randomly, and then very soon, while they collide, they will stick together, and then their motion will now be, be uh, correlated. That's what we are observing right now. And so implementing cell growth in Blender was actually super straightforward. I was very happy with that. And because we use the built-in mesh shrink factor, um, shrinking factor. And when this factor is below uh, zero or below uh, the initial shape, then it shrinks, otherwise uh, it grows. And that, so we then extended this function so that users now can choose between a, an exponential or a linear growth, because both are possible um, in, develop, in biology, basically. Then I should note that a tissue is actually a very confined environment. Like moving around when there's many cells around you, many molecules, proteins, is quite the task. So it's super packed. And so it's only natural that we started making those simulations um, of cells growing in boxes and sphere. And that allows us to investigate how cells grow when put in a constrained or uh, confined environment, which is very much the case in reality. And so now that we have soft body physics running, we have motion, we have growth, and we have adhesion, we can start creating those nice simulations of growing tissues. And so each of the 22 cells here moves independently from the others, but they all adhere to each other. Plus, they grow until reaching a volume that is about three times higher than their initial volumes. We also implemented different cell types in Blender. And a type here, from a biological point of view, is defined as a unique set of biophysical properties that's unique to a specific collection of cells. And so, here in this example, cell-cell adhesion is specific to each type, meaning that red will only adhere, will only adhere to red, purple to purple, but also, uh, it's harder to see, but the red cells actually moves faster than the purple cells. And so now I'd like to discuss a last few work in progress regarding cell division and solving differential equation with simulation nodes. So first, implementing cell division in Blender has proven to be quite the task. And I tried a few different Blender functions to achieve this result, but didn't manage to get it running for now. So the first thing I tried was using a subdivision surface, basically cutting the topology into filling up the, ho the holes. But this is really computationally intractable when we're expanding the simulation to many cells. Then I found a trick to do that, which is using a Boolean surface with a super thin um, division plane. That solved the issue, but this is not really how cell division work. And so the last thing I tried was to have kind of a, a torus-like um, ring that pinches the cell uh, along the division plane. But that proved to be really hard to do. Um, even though it's computationally tractable and realistic, we're still struggling with that and how to, uh, at the end, bring those two newly created hemispheres into a new spherical topology. So I'm very happy to chat with anyone that has an answer here.
because I've been struggling. It would save my time. So I'm also working on using the new simulation nodes to solve regulatory circuits. And so I'll, I'll uh, I will illustrate the idea with the quite simple circuits here, where A converts into B at rate beta 1, B into C at rate beta 2, and B and C also being degraded respectively at rate alpha 1 and alpha 2. And so this circuit can be re rewritten as a system of ordinary differential equation. I promise we're not going to dive into equations, just to give an example here. And so in order to solve the system, it requires integration over time at each frame, and which is basically what a, a node solver is supposed to do. And so given some initial condition, um, this particular uh, system of equation can be solved with a Python ODE solver here, and that gives the concentration of each uh, A, B, and C over time. And so what, what we want to do now is, because we want to do everything in Blender, because we don't like library dependencies and everything, I am working on using the new simulation nodes to work on two implementations uh, of, um, of ODE solving, and two famous met methods of that are the forward Euler and the Runge Kuta implementations. It's a work in progress. I've seen some people working already on that, so I'm sure there's a lot of collaborations here to do. So, from taking inspiration from the famous cellular automata concept and from the large and amazing Blender community, we extended the software towards applications in artificial life, or A-life for short. We aim on the long run to recreate several hours of principles of uh, zebrafish embryonic development. And so, also on the long run, we aim to develop, to evolve programs to make patterns and shapes which means quantifying how well specific programs or rules have we've seen, um, uh, our rules are, are basically uh, selecting patterns and shapes um, over time. And so the parameter space here explo explore, explode or blows up really quickly. And so we need an efficient 3D mesh based cellular model um, in which we can vary the initial conditions and the um, regulatory circuits to um, explore, uh, I mean, to, to run simulations, and then to see what is the output, which one is favored through uh, selection. And so, great news because Blender proved to be a very promising tool to pave the way towards this, this direction. And I will end with a very slight note, meaning that um, you will find currently uh, a release that is simply. Um, a Python library that can be run um, in Blender, which is, say, the beta version. And we are aiming in the, in the next couple of months to add new functions, uh, that is cell division, differential equations being solved, and also um, molecular communications with particle systems. Um, and we will, of course, release that through geometry nodes and simulation nodes that should I mean, we hope there will be a really nice user interface for people to use, but also um, should bring more power and will allow us to do more powerful simulations. And so we are a team of computer, uh, we are a team of biologists and computer scientists. So we're really, look we're really looking to have collaborations with Blender aficionados. So please come and talk to us after because we'd love to get involved with you guys. And so to conclude, I'd like to thank all the ones that contributed uh, to the development of Goo until today. And so you can find all the information about Goo on this website. And finally, I'd like to thank also the Magison Laboratory for which I work at Harvard because it is a dream job, so it's pretty amazing. So please come and find me and Sean Magison in the couple next days. Thank you.